Hello, everybody. This is Grandmaster Robert Hungaski for ChessLecture.com. And today I thought I'd go back to one of my favorite openings and one of my favorite series that I've done for Chess Lecture, and that is the one dealing with the fried liver. Now, one of the members of Chess Lecture has reached out to me and asked me to cover a line, a sideline, but a very important sideline in the fried liver, one that has become quite popular recently because of its forcing nature, maybe not necessarily because of its objective worth, but one that is definitely worth spending a little bit of time on. So after the moves e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, knight g5, d5, e takes d5, knight a5, bishop b5, c6, dc6, bc6, and bishop d3. So this is our critical position, our starting position. Here we've discussed many moves before, the main move knight d5, of course, h6 as well. <laughs> but today I wanted to focus on the move knight to g4. Now this is a very tricky move, and if white is not ready for it, then you can get into a lot of trouble very soon. The point of knight g4, just like knight d5 or h6, is to use the misplacement of the knight on g5 to carry out black's basic idea of playing f5 and e4. It doesn't matter which variation black plays, whether it's knight d5, h6, or knight g4, they all share this common theme. Let's not forget, black has sacrificed a pawn, black has a shattered pawn structure, and a terribly placed knight on a5. So black needs to get some serious compensation here in order to justify all of these things. And at the core of that compensation, this f5, e4 plan is always there, right? So this is simply a different way of going about the same idea. For example, always our question is going to be, where should our knight retreat to e4 or f3? And we need to ask ourselves, well, which moves makes it more difficult? For black to play f5, e4. For example, if knight f3 here, unlike knight d5, we see that this knight is actually not threatening to take on e5. So it allows black to play the move f5 just in time. And the point is that if white plays h3, trying to kick the knight out so that we can take the pawn on e5, that would of course be wonderful. Black can play knight takes f2, and after king takes f2, first bishop c5, and after king e1, e4. Black regains the piece, but we have serious king safety problems, so black is doing absolutely great here. This is not what we're aiming for. So after knight g4, the correct move is knight e4. And this might seem a little bit counterintuitive because we are running into f5 right away. But this is where all the forcing sequences come in. So after f5, any other move besides bishop e2 is going to lead to a huge advantage, if not a winning advantage for black. For example, if knight g3, bishop c5, castle kingside, queen h4, the game is practically over. So at this point, white plays bishop e2, and a long sequence of forced moves begins. One where actually black is not going to be doing so badly, but I do believe that white has a substantial advantage and an advantage that's going to be very difficult for black to deal with in practice. So here, black has a couple of options. Going back to f6 is not particularly appealing because this allows white to carry out his regular plan of simply trading and playing the pawn to d3, right? The main driving force in white's position is actually twofold. One, to prevent black from playing e4, and two, to recycle the bishop from d3 and get our pawn to d3. If white is able to accomplish these two things, usually it's all downhill from there for black. So the other option would be to retreat the knight to h6. This also does not solve uh, the problems because now 
we can definitely go knight g3, and our next move is going to be d3. And now that the knight's not on g4 anymore, we can actually castle with a clear conscience. So black's move here is pawn to h5. And now after pawn to h3, notice there is no knight takes f2 anymore. So black has to go f takes e4, and after h takes g4, bishop c5. Now, I believe this to be the critical position of the knight g4 variation so far. All the moves we've seen are forced, and here white needs to make an important decision. There are a couple of moves that can be played here. Um, b4, knight c3 come to mind, g takes h5, castle kingside. I mean, these all seem like legitimate candidate moves, but I think we can immediately rule out castling kingside because this is simply going to uh, castle our king into a devastating attack. Now, either h takes g4 followed by queen h4 is going to lead to checkmate or even queen h4 right away. So castle kingside is a terrible blunder. Uh, the other natural looking move you could say is g takes h5. This is equally losing right? Because of the presence of the pawn on e4 and the absence of a knight on f3, white's king side is deserted. So black can simply castle, and the next move is again going to be queen to h4, and there's no good way of defending the pawn on f2. So here, the two reasonable moves are knight c3, which we will not be covering, but it's an okay move, and the move that I like, which is b4, and that's the move that was played in this game. So white sacrifices a pawn to disrupt the coordination of black's pieces, and most importantly, to distract black's attention from the weakest point in our position, which is the pawn on f2. So the basic idea is that after bishop takes b4, then we can go knight c3 and the bishop on b4 is not particularly well placed. And here we're going to have enough time to defend our position. For example, if queen d4, g takes h5, bishop c5, uh, castle kingside, and now after castle kingside, we have enough time to defend 